Hi everyone and welcome to this evening's event in which we're going to be hearing from two incredible authors about their work and their thoughts on the fantastic. Susanna Clarke is the author of two masterpieces of speculative fiction, Jonathan Strange and Mr Norrell and Piranesi. The first is set in an alternative version of 19th century England. It came out in 2004 and it earned Clarke widespread critical and commercial success. It was also filmed as a BBC drama in 2015. Susanna published a short story collection, The Ladies of Grace Adieu, set in the same universe as Jonathan Strange in 2006. And Piranesi was published in 2020 and crowned winner of the Women's Prize for Fiction 2021. Alan Moore is widely regarded as the best and most influential writer in the history of comics. His seminal works include From Hell, V for Vendetta and The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. He's also the author of the best-selling novel, Jerusalem, and most recently, his first ever short story collection, Illuminations, which I have here. We're going to start this evening with a real treat. Both authors are going to give us a very short reading from their most recent works. So, um, Alan, over to you. What have you chosen to read for us? Well, I was going to read a story called Location, 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 or a, a little bit of the story. It needs a little bit of setting up, otherwise you won't understand any of it. Uh, this was a, a few years ago, um, I'd heard about the Panacean Trust over in Bedford, which were a group of women in uh, the early 20th century who became obsessed with Joanna Southcott, the visionary, the woman clothed in the sun. And they had the box that she had said should not be opened until the apocalypse. Um, they actually owned this box. So... Uh, they'd also they'd bought a terraced house for Jesus to live in when he returned, as he obviously would after the apocalypse, and they had reason, probably quite correctly, that he would want to live in Bedford. Um, they had their own reasons, I'm sure. But uh, anyway, this story is basically, I was thinking, yeah, that's really funny. What if it was true? which was the beginning of this story. Location, location, location. <laughs> Bedford approached perfection. Angie checked the dashboard clock. It was a bit before 10.30 on that final Sunday morning with no people on the streets and other than her own, no moving vehicles. All things considered, an unusually pretty August day. Progressing eastward down deserted Mill Street, the subdued purr of the Astra's engine seemed almost embarrassing against an otherwise uninterrupted silence, like some noisy child she had unwisely taken to a funeral. She made a right turn into Castle Road before she reached the looming church spire of St Cuthbert's, indicating only out of habit. There was nobody behind her. Sun rays fell in columns beautifully dappling the pavements and parked cars outside the John Bunyan Museum as she passed it on her right, the mottled light resulting from that last day's atmospheric circumstances. Angie's weather app, for once, had been entirely accurate. The heavens shall be made a sea of glass, like unto crystal, wherein seven candlesticks shall be displayed. Essay in a smooth curve into the Castle Road's main stretch, she only counted four of these, baroque, floating immensities that made the stomach flip to look at them, but had no doubt the other three were lost from view, somewhere behind the tall trees that rising at this end of Newnham Road. She made an effort to ignore the sky, just as she did her best to screen out all the other troubling elements of that eventful weekend, through a single-minded concentration on her duties as the Charitable Trust's executor beneficiary of the bequest, back in town after a long period away, would meet her at the property in a few minutes for a viewing and a handing over of the keys and necessary documents. She had no clear idea of her career arc after that, nor where she saw herself in 12 months' time. Parking a short walk from the Albany Road Junction, Angie noticed that one of the red brick terraced houses on the street's far side still had a sun-bleached Brexit party poster in its downstairs window. Was it really just the end of last year when all that stuff had been going on with half the population busily anticipating world's end while the other half prepared for paradise? Above the castle mound and hidden river to the south, there was a beast that had a lion's head 
plus six wings crammed with heavy-lidded and incurious eyes. This, surely, was the worst possible outcome, one where absolutely everybody turned out to be right. Sighing resignedly, she climbed out of the car. It was a glorious day. Its air was clean and fresh, with, on the breeze, a mental redolence that she identified as incense, perhaps eucalyptus. Also, once outside the Astra, her discovery that the pervasive hodge was laced with distant birdsong made the Enterprise seem less intimidating, although only slightly. Over the far end of Castle Road, off to the east, a second towering eminence presided. This one with a bull's head, but the same six its wings folded around it like enormous fans, the same indifference in their thousands of unblinking eyes. The birds were nice, though. Still a few yards from the Albany Road turning, she was briefly startled by her first sight of the client, glimpsed across the box-cut privet bordering the corner house. Standing in the middle of the road in front of his new residence, he had his back to her and appeared to be contemplating the allotments on Albany Road's far side, directly opposite his garden gate and white front door, both for the moment closed against him. Though she'd done her best to banish any preconceptions, he was nothing like what she'd expected. Not so tall, for one thing, perhaps fleshier. He had on a rust-coloured summer jacket worn with matching slats and what seemed to be Air Max trainers. Mousy collar-length hair with blonde tips and highlights, something like a mullet. He was bathing, sipping intermittently from a stylized gold fountain pen as he surveyed the straggling allotment. Confident now that her navy trouser suit and near homeopathic trace of makeup had been the correct decision, Angie called a breezy greeting as she ticked off into Albany's deserted quiet. Um, hi. I'm guessing you're my half past ten to see the house. I'm, I'm Angie from Carstairs and Calderwood. I, I hope you haven't been here long. He turned at her and smiled, sipping the vape pen into his breast pocket. Oh, no, only a few minutes. I arrived a little early anyway, wanted a bit of time to wallow in nostalgia, I suppose, and get a feel for how the place is now. Nice to meet you, Angie. Fantastic, Alan. And can you just give us a little clue? What what What's this guy's name? What name is he going to give Angie in a few paragraphs like, uh, time? A bit later on, he he, he looks down. He, she, she asked what she should call him because she doesn't want to get into trouble. Should it be your highness or your, your holiness? Or And he looks down at his band t-shirt which has got i may be old but i saw all the best bands and he laughs self-deprecatingly and says well i suppose in in this outfit i must look like a bit of a jazz must not and so she says jet it is and then they go into say excellent the well it's well worth the a read if, if you haven't read it yet <laughs> susanna um are you going to read us a little bit from piranesi i am um piranesi is about a man who lives in a house in which an ocean is imprisoned. And the book is really his entries in his journal. So this is from very, very close to the beginning, where he describes his world, which is the house. Um, so this is one of his, his um, journal entries. A description of the world. Entry for the seventh day of the fifth month in the year the albatross came to the southwestern halls. I am determined to explore as much of the world as I can in my lifetime. To this end, I have travelled as far as the 960th hall to the west, the 890th hall to the north, and the 768th hall to the south. I have climbed up to the upper halls where clouds move in slow procession and statues appear suddenly out of the mists. I have explored the drowned halls where the dark waters are carpeted with white water lilies. I have seen the derelict halls of the east where ceilings, floors, sometimes even walls have collapsed and the dimness is split by shafts of grey light. 
In all these places I have stood in doorways and looked ahead. I have never seen any indication that the world was coming to an end, but only the regular progression of halls and passageways into the far distance. No hall, no vestibule, no staircase, no passage is without its statues. In most halls, they cover all the available space, though here and there you will find an empty plinth, niche or apse, or even a blank space on a wall otherwise encrusted with statues. These absences are as mysterious in their way as the statues themselves. I have observed that while the statues of a particular hall are more or less uniform in size, there is considerable variation between halls. In some places, the figures are two or three times the height of a human being, in others, more or less life-size, and in yet others, only reach as high as my shoulder. The drowned halls contain statues that are gigantic, 15 to 20 metres high, but they are the exception. The windows of the house look out upon great courtyards, barren, empty places paved with stone. The courtyards are generally four-sided, although now and then you will come upon one with six sides or eight, or even, these are rather strange and gloomy, only three. Outside the house, there are only the celestial objects, sun, moon and stars. The house has three levels. The lower halls are the domain of the tides. Their windows, when seen from across a courtyard, are grey-green with the restless waters and white with the spatter of foam. The lower halls provide nourishment in the form of fish, crustaceans and sea vegetation. The upper halls are, as I have said, the domain of the clouds. Their windows are grey-white and misty. Sometimes you will see a whole line of windows suddenly illuminated by a flash of lightning. The upper halls give fresh water, which is shed in the vestibules in the form of rain and flows in streams down walls and staircases. Between these two largely uninhabitable levels are the middle halls, which are the domain of birds and of men. The beautiful orderliness of the house is what gives us life. This morning, I looked out of a window in the 18th Southeastern Hall. On the other side of the courtyard, I saw the other looking out of a window. The window was tall and dark. The other's noble head, with its high forehead and neatly trimmed beard, was framed in one corner. He was lost in thought, as he so often is. I waved to him. He did not see me. I waved more extravagantly. I jumped up and down with great energy. But the windows of the house are many, and he did not see me. Thank you, Susanna. That was wonderful. I'm there in the house, lapped by ocean. Amazing. Um, Thank you both so much of you. What a way to spend a Thursday evening hearing you both read from your books. Now, we are going to be chatting for about 45 minutes and then um, I'll be asking Alan and Susanna some of your questions. So do send them in. So we've got lots to talk about. Alan and Susanna, I wanted to start by casting your minds back to early reading experiences. This is because reading Piranesi, Susanna, you start with a quote from The Magician's Nephew. And this cast me back to my childhood reading of that book and made me realise, I think, for the first time that it was that book that really opened me up to reading and to the fantastic. When you realise the links with the lion, the witch and the wardrobe, that you see the tree that the wardrobe is made from, it just sort of lit me up with the joy of literature. I found it really joyful. How about you both? Do you have a particular book that you can trace your joy in literature and the fantastic back to? Alan, let's start with you because Susanna just read us all that. <laughs> well, I... There are probably many, many books that mm. I could um, refer to, but the one that sticks in my mind actually does have something in common with Piranesi. Uh, it was the, the first book that really taught me what could be done with 
fantasy and writing and the human imagination, that would probably have been Mervyn Peake's Titus Grown, uh, which I read when I was about 13. And I remember that the first chapter, uh, when I was 13, I thought it was incredibly dull because all it was talking about was the architecture of Gormenghast. It was just creating this huge, ponderous architecture of endless stone corridors and the Hall of Bright Carvings and the Room of Roots. And But it was, I realised before I'd finished the book, I'd realised why Pete had done that in the first chapter, because it is creating an architecture. It's creating a metaphysical architecture that will probably remain the first, much of your life. Uh, I mean, there are places that I've visited in the real world that I've completely forgotten about. But I still remember the Hall of Bright Carvings mm. and the Room of Roots. Um, a fantasy, a brilliant fantasy, actually constructs itself inside the reader's mind, uh, which is one of the things that I thought, yeah, it's a completely different book to Piranesi, but there's that architectural quality uh, in what Susanna has done in that book, which reminded me of Peak more than it reminded me of anybody. Just mm -hmm. those, yeah, putting it down word by word, stone by stone, until you've actually built the structure inside the reader's imagination, you know. So, yeah, the Gormenghast books were probably the first books that alerted me to what could be done with writing, with sufficient drive. You know, how interesting. Well, the same question to you, Susanna. But but before we get to that, is there is there anything of peak for you in um, Piranesi? Was was that in your mind at all? I think so. There were things that were more more in my mind, notably um, Borges, um, Jorge Borges. Luis Borges, um, and also to a certain extent C.S. Lewis, because it 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 does sort of have these echoes of the magician's nephew. So if you cross Borges and C.S. Lewis, you sort of get Piranesi. But I mean, I do, I, I did, yes, Gormenghast was, was there. And it is quite nerve wracking writing a book and beginning it with pages and pages of description of statues and staircases. And you think no one's gonna to want to read this. And so, um, yeah, I don't know if, if Peak actually had that same sort of anxiety, but I definitely did. Yeah. Maybe publishing into a less commercial marketplace. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> so but it is it is a bit nerve wracking. Yeah. yeah. But some readers would have been quite happy if Piranesi was nothing but description. Some readers just felt so at home um, that they would have been OK with it, actually. Um, I guess for me, unsurprisingly, the the books which I, when I look back at my childhood, the books that dominated are the Narnia books. Um, it just it just was a world in which I felt completely at home but I think it, it sort of made it, it in a way it's what Alan's talking about it it I it wasn't that I realized fantasy literature did something different perhaps from other literature I just felt more at home in felt with in Narnia and in other similar books perhaps historical books I just always felt more at home in some way that wasn't the modern world um it just it, it made more sense to me um and then in, in my teenage years I read Ursula Gwynne's Earthsea and despite that being in in many ways a sort of archetypal fantasy with wizards and dragons it was it was so real and it gave me something which I was missing in my actual life um I was thinking about this my life as a teenager was sort of there were two poles there was church and there was school and in both of these this was in Bradford in West Yorkshire in the 1970s in both of these there were very 
both places required that you behave in very particular ways and believe very particular things. School as much as church, I would say. And neither of these were, were ways that I felt were particularly me. So books like Earthsea sort of made a place for my emotions and made a place for my my dreams and my intellect and I was you know I, I was at home there and just as Alan said if I look to the to not so much to the architecture but to the landscape of some of those islands that make up Earthsea particularly the farthest west island Selidor the description that I, I know that place I, I feel I have walked there um, I know it better than I know m most places in the real world. Yeah, I feel like uh, so look, the, the Earth Sea books are so they're, they're so pure and true in terms of the fantasy. You feel like it is it's these clear drops of fantasy just coming to you yes. right from the source. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, both of your work is so deeply rooted in the fantastical and in the rich history of that genre um, from Piranesi and it's the architectural fantasies of Giovanni Battista Piranesi to the wonders and the monsters of the, the League of Extraordinary Gentlemen, Alan, and all of the places they, they come from. I was rereading um, the first one uh, the other evening and I hadn't noticed before Katie Carr, who I was delighted to see there from what Katie did. So <laughs> sadistic Katie Carr in the in the school <laughs> that made me very happy. Um, anyway, what, for both of you, was fantastical the, the fantastical always the genre you were going to be drawn to writing in, and and, and what draws you to it, Susanna? Um, no, yes, no, yes. <laughs> I, I originally was writing a detective novel, and that was what I wanted to write because I read quite a lot of detective novels. I feel I I, I like them. Um, I've there's something I, I enjoy, and that was what I was going to do, but I could not do it. The plot, my mind doesn't work in that way, or it didn't then. And all these sort of slightly eerie atmospheres kept coming in, and this <laughs> sort of surrealism kept, kept sort of drifting in. And in the end, I just had to, after years of trying, I had to give it up. And then I wasn't going to be a writer because I thought I'd failed as a writer. That's fine. I'll do something else. But then fantasy just sort of leaving detective fiction, crime crime fiction, and just sort of made fantasy well up more and more. And and then, yeah, and, and then I started writing something which eventually became Strange and Norrell, although it started a very long way from where it finished up. Mm. Um, but yeah, it 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 is it is something that just makes more sense to me um, than other other sorts of writing. I I've also been rereading Alan and and what he has to say about meaning and symbolism, and I feel that fantasy literature, good fantasy literature, is. It gives meaning to the re to the reader. The in the, in it, the the reader finds a world which is meaningful. And so much of the world that we actually live in, we feel probably wrongly, but we feel is meaningless. So we find meaning in 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 fantasy literature. Is there something in particular in Alan's work that that you're you're thinking of there? Um. I have to say it's Promethea, which I think shaped me in ways that I I haven't read it for a long time, but I've been rereading it this afternoon, and it is, I think it I think it's it had a profound effect on me. Um, it 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 is the story of a woman who becomes. She's the living embodiment of imagination, which is what we are talking about. We are talking about imagination. And, and she is what, um, she brings the blessings of imagination to mankind. And she also goes on a long journey through heaven following the Kabbalah. So that, um, that I love that. I I, not everyone's cup of tea maybe, but that absolutely mine. <laughs> 
Excellent. Same question to you, Alan. Um, was was the fantastical always where you were going to end up? Did I mean you've written yeah. all sorts of things? Probably. It was always it was always something where I was always going to be fairly invested in the fantastical. Uh, I mean, the beginnings of it were magical children's stories, and particularly once I discovered mythology. Uh, I was devouring all of the Greek myths, the Roman myths, particularly the Norse myths. And I think that the thing I liked about them was that they were full of things that never happened. Uh, other books had things that do happen and or could possibly happen. But sort of, I thought that things that can't possibly happen have got to be the most attractive and wonderful things of all um so yeah it was pretty much a straight progression from mythology to superhero comics and science fiction and fantasy at a very young age and fantasy is a very big word that covers a lot of territory i mean looked at in one way fantasy is a big kind of mother genre in which you could easily include science fiction and horror and all the rest of it. Um, so, yes, I've always been uh, entranced by a good fantasy, but it has to be a good fantasy. It has to be something well, like Ursula K. Le Guin's Earthsea, which uh, I've just today ordered. Um, Melinda suggested that I order it uh, for my grandson, Rowan. Uh, we're just running out of the fantasy trilogy that he's reading at the moment, and we thought, "Hey, Earthsea, that would be that." Because I remember I read that in my twenties, and uh, yeah, that has got something special. It might be a conventional fantasy in a, fa a fantasy universe, but that is one that I would make an exception for, because there is just something so human about the the characters, irrespective of the world that they're in. Um, it is saying something about real emotional human life. Uh, I think that all fantasies have to be grounded somewhere in, in dreams, in emotions, but they have to be grounded in something that actually touches human life. Otherwise, I don't think that they would be the, the, the wonderful kind of sanctuary that Susanna was talking about, because yes, they are. A great fantasy book is is a, is a world of its own and it's a world of your own. Um, but I don't think that they would be, be quite as appealing if they were completely divorced from any human consequences or any human situations, even emotional situations. You know, I guess... I can probably think of loads of exceptions to my own rule, but sort of, um, you know, there are a lot of things that are pure fantasy, don't seem to relate to anything but themselves, and they're wonderful. But in general, uh, mm. I prefer it if there is some connection, you know, um, something, you know, just connecting it to the human experience. But taking that human experience into a completely previously unimagined space. Do you read much of fantasy that's published contemporarily, Alan? And do you have thoughts about it? I don't read very much. Um, uh, I've, I've read some. I mean, the, the, probably the last fantasy book that I read would have been Piranesi. Um, that sort of. But before that, I mean, there are there are exceptions. There are things like, say, Brian Catlin's War trilogy which was, uh, I found, stupefying. Um, and I, I, I tend to like old, weird fantasy books like um, David Lindsay's Voyage to Arcturus, which is one of those books that is probably unfathomable. It is complete fantasy. Um, the characters are developing new sense organs with each new world they move into. It's probably some vast Gnostic allegory that I've not completely penetrated, but 
gives such a wonderful feeling. Or William Hype Hodgson's House on the Borderland. You know, it's sort mm -hmm. of... Uh, fantasy can be an awful lot of things. That is the thing that I like about it. Uh, it's what I object to is when it's not so much even traditional fantasy that I object to, but it's the it's when people insist that everything be traditional fantasy or it isn't fantasy. You know, mm. fantasy is a much bigger word than I think people give it credit for. Absolutely. So you recently read Piranesi. What what did you think of it? <laughs> what did I? Th I thought it was magnificent. It's sort of uh, uh, like I. I was, I think, saying earlier that sort of it actually creates an architectural metaphysical space. It's more than a book. It is a metaphysical architecture, you know, and I can understand why a lot of readers, Susanna was saying that they'd have been quite happy if she just went on describing all the rooms and all the statues. I can understand that, you know, uh, and I mean, it, it has a wonderful plot as well. <laughs> Which uh, was some, I mean, from the moment when there's a bit in Piranesi where you, you describe um, the skeletons, the uh, the skeletons that Piranesi is looking after that he's found around the house. And uh, one of them is wrapped around a Huntley and Palmer's biscuit tin. Um, and that was a really spine tingling moment the introduction i mean usually with fantasy it's the real situation and the spine tingling moment is something of the fantastical that suddenly manifests in that situation but what susanna had pulled was the perfect reverse of that where all of a sudden it's the huntley and palmer's biscuits that are the uncanny object you know uh that that was remarkable and there were lots of touches like that sort of uh yeah it, it's uh of, I, I thought it was a magnificent book i mean and that is uh, uh, strange and gnarl but i thought that piranesi uh it, it was a different level i'm not i'm not you know i don't want to compare them because that would make strange and gnarl which was a different book sound like the lesser of the two which it isn't you know but i was just so impressed by this, it was a completely different level of accomplishment, or it seemed so to me, that just this, because Strange and Norrell has got a few tropes that are recognisable from other things, whereas Piranesi had none that I could see. I mean, I'm sure that, yeah, I, I get the, the Boyes reference particularly, um, I've, I've been looking at some Boyes lately, you know, and sort of stories like Salon Bar, Orbis Tertius, uh, which is the imaginary world that scholars are creating in this encyclopedia that it somehow exists. Uh, if that much is known about it and has been written about it, then it somehow exists. Yeah, um, I can see that in relation to Piranesi. It's it's reaching like Boyes did. It's reaching beyond fantasy to some degree, for something that's kind of ineffable, you know. A that's wonderful quite a write up there for you, Susanna. Wow, it's amazing. <laughs> and you've got you, um, you 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 said a little earlier before the event started that Piranesi itself draws a little from Alan's yeah. own work. Yeah, um, there's there was a sense that I wanted the house to feel a bit to be very very strange and at the same time to feel slightly familiar and I realized that I was drawing on something Alan said at the end of Promethea at the end of the Promethea um I don't want to give too much of the plot away there's a house there's a house That's which has many, many, away. many. I, th I think it's quite <laughs> difficult to give the plot of Promethea away. Actually, um, you'd have to you'd have to talk for quite a while to do so. But at the end, there's a house with many, many rooms, and people just find themselves in this house. And at one point, one of the characters says, 
don't haven't you dreamt of this house or a house very like it with lots of staircases and rooms and you're just going through this huge house and I thought yes I have I have dreamt of that house I know I have on many occasions um and people also I think this is right people go to different rooms and find themselves in different periods of their life and as I get older that house is truer and truer for me because I'm now 64 and I feel almost that I could go into a different room and into my teenage years or go into a different room and into my these things are quite close and I'm sure as it get as I get older that there's this sort of sense so that sense of the familiarity of that huge house I was, I not only drew on Alan, but I took courage from what he'd written there to think maybe people will find this not only just a really weird house, but a little bit familiar. And I think some, I think people have actually. Yeah. I mean, yeah. My, 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 the, the house that I was basing it on is one that I thought that only turned up in my dreams. It's probably different houses, although it always feels like the same one. Yeah. And I don't know if this is true of yours, your house, uh, Susanna, but um, in mine, the the stairways are often like blocked with old school desks or something like that. Uh, there are impediments. There are. It's difficult to get from room to room and floor to floor, and you can never find your way back to the place that you really liked and wanted to find your way back to. Yes. It's, uh, but the, I suppose that the house, as you were saying about the rooms where your teenage self is or your 30-year-old self or whatever, I guess the house has got to be our lives, hasn't it? Yeah. Um, purely and simply, it's our lives which where some of the stairways are blocked with old school desks, you know, or things like that, yeah. It's definitely one of the things it is. I, I also tend to find dream about houses, which I think is my house, and then I find there's a whole other level. This is very Jungian, with <laughs> that's filled with with lumber and stuff that I that that's sort of decaying. That's that's it's a bit disturbing, really. <laughs> Susanna and Alan, you you met ages ago because Susanna, you interviewed Alan um, about Lost Girls when when it came out. Yes. I, I read that interview, which is a fantastic interview. I would definitely recommend it to anyone who wants to find out more about Alan and Lost Girls. Um, but you talk in that about your experience of reading Watchmen for the first time um, and how it kind of turned the world grey for you because you wanted to be in the book all of the time. Tell us about that feeling, which all us readers know well. I was not allowed to. Well, not not. Yeah, I was not allowed to read comics when I was growing up. And I was a girl I, and I was a child and I definitely wasn't the market, but I was fascinated by comics. But I, it was sort of frowned upon. This isn't for you, you know, because you're a girl and you're respectable and this isn't for you. And you're intellectual also, you know, you can't read Jane Austen and comics. That's not, you know, in the 1970s and 80s, that was clearly not a thing you could do. But I worked in... Covent Garden, my first job, and I could walk to Forbidden Planet, which was then a bit closer to Covent Garden than it is now. And I used to go in full of boys, full of boys, full of young men, but I, and I would very nervously go in and I would look at these Alan Moore graphic novels and think, dare I buy one? <laughs> and eventually I did dare buy one and it was Watchmen. And I read it over a weekend or most of it over a weekend and I could not stop reading it and it possessed me in the way no other book has before or since I just it just I got to the it got to Sunday night and I thought I've got to stop reading this because I've got to go to work in the morning so very regretfully I put it down and the next day I went to work and I felt ill I felt ill of not reading the book. It was just really, I, I mean, it was a physical, actually physically, I felt un, completely unsettled and, 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 and ill. And that I just promised myself foolishly that I would wait till the following weekend to finish. And of course I did not moment I walked in the door, I picked it up. I don't think I took my coat off and I just read it until I finished. 
And then I suppose I was ill of not having the book to read <laughs> anymore. But it was it was quite extraordinary. I mean, I just it was not just imagination, but it was it was operatic. So many things were going on at the same time. And because it was the form, the 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 medium it was, you could it was very, very difficult to do this in prose. I don't know what Alan thinks, but in a a graphic novel, you can have the speech doing one thing, you can have the picture doing another thing, and you can have something else symbolising. You can have three or four strands going, and I had never realised that anyone could do that. I wouldn't dare try it in um, in prose. The, the closest I got to it was the footnotes in Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. Uh, but I do envy. Footnotes are good. The, um... um, <laughs> but, but it's not quite the same opera you can do it in opera because you can have people singing completely different lines of melody and you can make and they can be singing they can have be having completely different emotions and because it's music you can make sense of the whole and you can follow the individual but i i, I think it's if you try to do it in prose it would just get embarrassingly tricksy very quickly well, I, I think that certainly there are things. I mean, I am um, uh, my my comics past is largely behind me at the moment, and I'm not going to be working in comics again because I am completely. I am persuaded that actually prose fiction um, is there are beautiful things that you can do in comics, but prose fiction is just so eloquent elegant because there are 26 characters and a peppering of punctuation and from that you can create the entire universe it's yes. sort of uh, i mean with uh, with comics yes you you have got other layers that you can you can work with uh, as susanna was saying it, yeah there's the there's the dialogue there's the captions there's the pictures there's any symbols that you've embedded in the pictures that can have their own narrative. There's all sorts of things. I mean, like when uh, we first met Susanna and Colin, when they came up to interview us about Lost Girls, um, yeah, it was, I mean, with, with Lost Girls, that was a, a, a fantasy, yeah, very much a fantasy work where we were actually dealing with sexual fantasy, which is probably the most common kind of fantasy in the world if we're going, not not in terms of printed fantasy, although it's probably that as well, um, but the way that we could actually take these three characters from children's fiction, Wendy, Dorothy and Alice, and actually, so we're talking about the imagination you can use comics to to do that in a more subtle way. You can have, yeah, just juxtapositions between what you're showing in the picture and, I mean, in one of the sequences in Lost Girls, we have a very, very repressed couple um, having a very boring uh, late-night conversation. Um, but their shadows on the wall behind them we we set up the panels so that their shadows are behaving orgiastically while they're, they're sort of talking about really dull everyday things and they obviously they don't like each other much so you know you can do wonderful things with that but uh no i mean thank you very much for for that assessment suzanne that's uh that's really good i'm I'm glad that I actually, I've still got the power to make people feel physically ill. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I, I love the I way get... you put that, Alan. Um, 26 characters and a peppering of punctuation. The the other thing I was thinking, I was thinking about this this afternoon, about one of the things, I don't know if this is right, but but it occurred to me that when you were doing comics, people sort of made you the responsible for the whole of comicdom. Because you were the leader, you were the one forging ahead. 
I presume you don't feel quite as responsible for the whole of English literature in the way people <laughs> made you responsible for the whole of comics. This is why working in literature is a huge relief. Yes, I would um, think. You know, it's like when when people sort of, yeah, they, they people talk about comics and they, even though I'm trying to sort of distance myself a little bit from comics, um, but uh, yeah, it's always. Yeah, I know that it, the in the first sentence of my obituary, the word Watchmen is going to be in there somewhere, isn't it? It's sort of, uh, but that is less likely to happen in the field of just general literature. Um, although I did in my novel Jerusalem, I put a quote on the back that I'd received, uh, and I think this is the best. Jacket quote of all time. Um, it was from a, I think a nine year old schoolboy in Naseby School, Naseby Primary School. And he, he had written me this letter. It was a lovely letter. And he just said, All in all, I think that you are the best author in human history. Please write back. So that was the quote that we put on the back of Jerusalem. Oh, <laughs> I, 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 did, I did write back and I said, the best author in human history, in your face, Shakespeare, <laughs> the band, <laughs> Peter, the <laughs> uh, So, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not likely to get singled out so much in the broader field of literature as I was in comics. So, yeah, that is a, that's a weight off my shoulders. Yeah. Oh, wow, what a lucky little boy to be on <laughs> on the book <laughs> that's brilliant let's talk a bit about magic how as a writer you come up with something that convinces how you write it the wellspring of literature that you draw from when you're writing it Susanna let's start with um Jonathan Strange and and magic there which has obviously been absent from England for some time when Mr Norrell admits to being able to do it how did you how did you make your magic work in in that book i i didn't um somebody asked i think the director asked me when they were filming it for television he said how does the magic actually work and i said i don't know um <laughs> you know it's it's very much a lit literary sort of magic but it's also i wanted it to be the book to be a bit about english landscape and the sort of way I felt sort of bringing something out of English landscape, because I, I love I love English landscape, I, I guess particularly northern English landscape. Um, I spent most of my life probably in the north half of England. Um, and I, I yeah, so so I, I felt as the book went on at the beginning it was very sort of spells and books and things but as it goes on it's really more about things coming out of England and the strength of England and the fairies who have a kind of um, who are more in connected um so I think and this is probably true of Piranesi as well the magic sort of more and more represents represents the spaces between systems, the spaces between disciplines, the space that the experiences we have that we can't quite elucidate, describe, and therefore which slip very easily out of our minds because we don't actually we can't describe them in words. So it might be religious experience or it might be spiritual experience or it might be landscape or animals or something but it's it, it, it's 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 the bits of our experience that we feel deeply that connect down to our subconscious but which we can't fit in very easily to to a, a system or a philosophy does that make any sense at all it makes perfect sense yeah I, I can say exactly what you mean there i mean it's uh, uh magic is it's a point of transition or something like that mm. from one system to another. Um, and in fiction, it is um, just the word magic will allow you 
to do almost anything, you know, because nobody knows what magic really is, even all of the self-styled magicians, because we're all self-styled. Uh, it's not like anybody's actually handing out diplomas for this stuff, you know. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's, it, you know, magic is entirely a thing of the mind. Um, uh, I don't believe that it can do anything in the physical world, but look what it can do in the mind, look what it can do in fiction. And also it does... Like what Susanna was saying about how Strange and Norrell had kind of was the magic became more about something that grows out of the landscape itself. I think that that's really important. It's sort of the the places that we inhabit, they are all magical places. But over the course of centuries, they have become disenchanted, literally. Um, in that we walk down these boring modern streets day after day, all throughout our lives, and that's all they are. They're boring modern streets uh, because they become disenchanted. It is possible um, through writing to re enchant these places. Uh, it is possible to, to either, as Susanna's done, to create a completely fantastic other world that is there in people's heads, or you can focus upon some part of the real physical world that we exist in and make that magical by studying, looking at its history, looking at the mythology of the space, looking at the stories that are connected to it, because in a way, they are as real and as important, possibly more important, than the physical bricks and mortar. Um, yes, there is the, the physical nature of spaces, but when we think of places, that's not what we're thinking about. We're thinking about our emotional reactions and our memories and the, the fictions and the fantasies and the, the legends that we associate with a place. That to my mind, is much more real. Um, I is mean, that, in, is, that, is that what you were setting out to do in um, Jerusalem, Alan, bringing that magic to that small section of Northampton? Yeah, well, yes, it was. I mean, with, I'd previously done Voice of the Fire, which was about the whole county of Northampton. And I thought, actually, that's far too far ranging. And I, I should be a much more conservative in my next book and just do it about a block or two. Um, but yeah, it was, it's the most deprived area in Northampton still. Um, it was where I grew up. It's, and all of the mythology, all of the legends, they're all there. Um, they're in the original, I really wanted Jerusalem to come out with based on a true story. Um, because it kind of is. Um, there was very little in that book that's made up. Yes, yeah, so I, I do know angels and demons and gods and things like that. No, it's uh, all of the characters in there and most of the events are as they happened. But with a certain cast, they can all be seen as magical. And I have had people say that when they walk through Northampton now, people from out of town, that they'll think, oh, that's the street where that happened in Jerusalem. So it creates an overlay. Mm -hmm. um, I think what London, if we think about Victorian London, we're inevitably not thinking about Victorian London. We're probably thinking about Charles Dickens uh, because fictions become part of the places that they're talking about. You know, this is one of the uses of fantasy. I think perhaps it's perhaps the best use of fantasy in that it is a really sophisticated way of actually modifying reality. Um, you know, sort of everything in the material world did come out of somebody's imagination. We are living amongst our unpacked imagination. Um, so <laughs> to me, it seems like there's almost like a membrane between 
things that do happen and things that don't happen between fact and between fiction and that things this this membrane must be semi-permeable because sometimes things slip through in one direction or the other um sometimes you get people who are completely real but will end up as fictional <laughs> it sort of it can happen um and on the other hand you'll get things that only existed in fiction that will uh like cyber attacks that we were talking about earlier that will somehow come through the membrane and then they're part of the real world i think of the world of fiction and the the world of fact has been two necessary parts of the same thing. I don't think this world would function physically if it didn't have its fantasy component. I don't think we would function without that vital fantasy component, whether it's in our dreams at night or whether it's in our literature. There's, there's a wonderful story, the first story of Voice of the Fire, which is actually quite a horrific story in some ways. But it's set way, 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 way back. I don't know what you would call it. When people was most people were still nomad, and there's some some people who have settled down in communities. But there's no way to physically get from one part of England to another because there's no roads and no sense. There's no sense really that if you go on a walk, when you go on the walk the second time, it'll be the same. It might be completely different. The trees might have moved or whatever. And somebody decides to make a road so that you can go from one place to another and you can do it again. And this is a radical, enormously radical idea. But the road is not a physical thing. It's a poem. The first road was a poem. And that is how deeply literature goes into lands landscape and literature. Uh, that I was an extraordinary what it, what it is is a sort of set of instructions that somebody could remember for going from one place to another and then doing it again and possibly even coming back, which was, was so radical at that time. Well, I think it's an extraordinary thing. Well, I I'd I'd heard the expression song line um talking about the aboriginal people in australia and their song lines which were how their dream time was constructed and i thought so what's a song line i, I kind of know what they mean but what is it and i was thinking we didn't invent maps until relatively late in the day so how did we get anywhere before we worked out two-dimensional representations of a three-dimensional territory? And I thought, well, the only way you could do it is with mnemonics. And the best form of mnemonics is rhyme. Um, that is probably one of the reasons why we invented poetry to start with. Probably not for decoration or for entertainment, but probably for purely practical reasons, yeah. you know, walk to the lightning blasted tree and then you shall in Norfolk be. Uh, <laughs> something like that. Um, and then there'd be further directions, you know, sort of, you know, walk past these rocks, carry on towards the setting sun um, in a straight line, and then you'll be in this place. And, I mean, in fact, the Northampton is on uh, something called the Jurassic Way, which was, uh, I think it was Edward Smith, the uh, father of English geology, uh, who had identified this limestone ridge that ran all the way from Lincoln down to Bath. And uh, that would have been one of the first tracks that actually made this country into a country from a bunch of settled sort of nomad communities or whatever that would have connected everything up and it would have been connected up i'm pretty sure with a song um so yeah susanna's right this is um th there is that great poem from i think it's gk chesterton uh before the romans up from gwent or out of seven strode the rolling english drunkard made the rolling English road. 
Um, <laughs> but yeah, there's a poetry to it, whichever way you look at it. Um, you know, it's not that poetry is a long way from drinking excessively. Yeah. You know, so sort of, uh, yeah, yeah. Amazing. I'm going to start asking you guys some questions from our brilliant listeners now because loads have come in and I want to try and get through some of them. So um, Phil is asking if Alan could give us a brief taste of what we can expect from the Long London cycle of books, which are out yes. when, Alan? I believe, and my publishers might be throwing up their hands in horror at this moment, but uh, <laughs> I believe it's possibly September this year. Mm -hmm. or around then autumn this year i think um it's completed as to what you can expect from it uh i hope you'll find um i, I didn't know what it was going to be like when i started writing it um i knew what the story was eventually uh and that the first book is set in 1949 uh, um and it deals with um yeah it's london after the war where a big hole has been blown in everything. Um, London and England are in ruins, psychologically and physically. And there is um, the suggestion of another world, another London that is all about, it's a symbolist London, if you like. It's some kind of, it's the, the meaning of London the mythology of London, the imagination of London that precedes the actual physical London itself. And it's a sort of an archetypal London where the things that happen there, we are just a shadow. It's this long London uh, is, is the stuff that's going on outside Plato's cave. And we are the shadows on the wall. That's the basic setup. The second book will jump ahead to 1959 and then 1969, 1979, and then an unexplained 20 year gap before 1999. Um, so it's a lot of it's about British history in the last century. And it will possibly turn out to be a lot about our, our present century, which will probably remain off stage throughout the entire series but that might be what i'm talking about that sort of um the way that the symbolic reality that underpins all human life is i think in the present day broken uh possibly demolished um that the things that gave us meaning and values and ideologies uh, I think that that's also 20th century. Um, that's, uh, that, yeah, that's so last millennium. Um, I think that we're in a different territory now. And that is one of the things that I want to talk about in Long London. But it's got some pretty good fantasy stuff in it as well, I've got to say. <laughs> um, you know, so I don't want to give very much of it away, but... Uh, I've tried to come up with some quite original things and it's got the most horrible talking cat that you possibly ever imagined. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Excellent. Well, that sounds, that sounds amazing. Susanna, can you give us any indication of what you're working on at the moment? Um, what's next from you? Um, Bradford. I'm working on a book about Bradford because who doesn't want to read a book about Bradford? I mean, absolutely. Um, so this is, yeah, this is very much, um, very much what Alan was talking about, about um, a place and what it means and um, what it meant to me. Because I was there, the, the, the difficulty is I, had, I lived there a long time ago in the 70s, but it was a sort of, I was a teenager and I think a place where you grew up as a teenager is hugely important and hugely you know has a great effect on you a huge emotional effect so it isn't about my life but bits of my life keep coming in um and because it's a book by me there is an italian all my books seem to have an italian bit so yeah 
but they leave Bradford and go to Italy for a bit and then they come back. All right, exciting. Now this um, next question from Ben, I am gonna read out in its entirety because it's beautifully phrased. What is the role of good writing and good fantasy in a civilization facing threats from climate catastrophe, AI, bio and nuclear weapons, volatile geopolitics and too much paperwork? Thank you and may the house fill your eyes with beauty. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give that to you, Susanna, because of the house. <laughs> um, well, I think fantasy is is hugely important as we face climate change and 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 sort of environmental disaster. Because what fantasy does, I think, I, I mean, literary fiction can do this as well. But I think fantasy is very good at the the other, the non-human, whether that is. Um, devils gods god the house um but also landscape animals it, it it's very good at giving a a view which is not the view we're locked into that's what it's trying to do good fantasy and good writing is sort of to take us out of our 21st century heads i mean i think historical fiction could do this as well which is why Jonathan Strange, Mr. Norwell were both historical and fantasy, but it's sort of to get you out of that space and to show you another possibility and to give voice to the non-human, I think, is is a very important thing. Totally. Would you agree with that, Alan? Yeah, I'd say that uh, fantasy probably plays a vital role. Uh, I think that it is what we need is a new way of seeing the world. I think that that is what we're vitally in need of, both in terms of our environment, in terms of our politics, in terms of most of the structures that actually make up the imaginary structures that nonetheless make up our material world. We have to be able to find a way to see a new world, to imagine one. Um, and... I think that, I mean, give it, the word has tremendous power. Um, you know, nobody should ever uh, underestimate the, the power of a well-written sentence, a well-written passage. They can change the world, if only in a small way, if only in one reader's mind. Or you could have, say, a book like Orwell's 1984, which um, arguably prevented the thing that he was talking about from happening, or at least in quite that way. That's not to say we aren't still menaced by the threat of totalitarian societies, but um, at least they probably won't do it in quite such a, a hackneyed way as they would have done if Orwell hadn't written that book. Uh, for example, in Northampton, where they tend to try out everything that would only be a remote fantasy for all of you people living in other parts of the country. I mean, you don't have little robot delivery boxes trundling along your streets, do you? But we do. Mm -hmm. And we've had <laughs> um, uh, the first, you know, the security cameras that are everywhere now, um, since I predicted them in Viva Vendetta and everyone thought, oh, that'd be a good idea. <laughs> uh, we had the in Northampton. We had security cameras that talked. Pick that cigarette end up. Yes, you. Uh, until they realised, oh, this is just such crap, George Orwell. Uh, this is embarrassing. We're going to stop doing that because everyone's just laughing at us. Uh, so yeah, things do change the world. It's sort of um, uh, a couple of years ago. I got a request to write a, a letter to the people of Brazil when they were on the eve of their election. And uh, I did, and Lula won, and Bolsonaro got thrown out. And I've got no way of telling whether my writing this letter, which Lula posted to the Brazilian electorate, I've got no way of knowing whether that influenced the, the election in any way. But if it did... That is probably the best three hours of writing that I will ever do in my entire life. So, yeah, words can change things. And I think that, yeah, fantasy and 
to develop the human imagination. It's like a muscle. If you don't develop it, it won't exist. Uh, and fantasy, I think, gives people's minds a workout, you know. Mm. Brilliant. I've got a nice question here from Morgan, um, which might end up being our last one unless we answer it very quickly. What fantasy world depicted in a work of fiction would either of you love to inhabit? It's a good question, I think. Maybe your house, Susanna. <laughs> I, I, well, I want to go to a sea. I'm not sure whether I want to stay there forever. Probably I would quite like to. Um, I, I, I just want to walk walk on Salidor for hours and hours. This the silence and the and the and the solitariness are just sort of call to me. Um so not go to I, wizard I, I, school I, then. Just go to the sorry? Go to the, not go to wizard school there then. <laughs> no, I'm I'm not that fussed. I, I, once upon a time I would definitely have wanted to go to a wizard school. I don't care that much about power anymore. And wizards are embarrassingly fond of power and I, I kind of think it's a bit of a rabbit hole really now so I'm not that bothered I probably would like to go and live in one of Diana Wynne Jones's worlds because that is I, I I yeah um possibly the world of the Merlin no, I'm not going to get this the right. Merlin my... Conspiracy. I just, the Merlin I, Conspiracy. I just the Merlin Conspiracy. I just read my... that a few weeks it's ago. It's <laughs> my favourite Diana Wynne Jones book, and it's but I can. It's such a ridiculous title that I can never remember what it is. Um, but I love that almost any of her worlds. I would like to live. <laughs> but it's also it's also living in a in a children's book would be just, just so much better than. Mm. Um... Maybe meeting Crestomancy would be. Yeah. Quite fun. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. How about you, Alan? Anywhere you'd go for sure? I, I, I tend to think that just reading the books is living in them um, for me. Um, and I have such a tenuous grip upon actual reality anyway that I am kind of living in a fantasy world all the time. So it would perhaps be a bit redundant if I was also living in Oz or Narnia or anywhere. You know, it's sort of uh, actually, my my world seems as limited and prescribed as it is. It it does seem quite fantastical to me, and more by the moment. I really I look at a newspaper or a um, you know some incoming news headlines, and yeah, that is about as much fantasy as I can take. Uh, just current reality is a lot more abnormal than anything that I had previously dreamed of. Yeah. So. Uh, I'm happy where I am. Thank okay. you. A dangerous question for you then. I think we can fit one more in. We've got like a minute left. And Tamsin has asked you both um, for a definition of fairy, um, thinking about sort of it in opposition to, to Disneyfication, asking what is fairy and why is it important? Maybe, Susanna, you could you could start on that one with um, all of the fairy, the fairy world of Jonathan Strange. Yeah. I, ooh, that is really hard. I think fairy changes um and so it changes depending on where you are in your life um but for me it it becomes a sort of repository of all the the non-human things that we are ignoring and um and abusing that whose voices we need to listen to um and it's also it's also about having stroppy people like um, the fairy and Jonathan Strange and Mister Norrell just being being kind of completely immoral and and <laughs> doing all the things we wished we could do without any sense of consequences at all. But no, for me at the moment, I would say it is about giving a voice to the 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 um, yeah the the things we are ignoring in the world but it a bit fairy is very malleable it changes a lot brilliant answer how, how about you alan i'd say that susanna's absolutely on the money there i'd say that the notion of fairy it is that which we have excluded from our world yeah um it is 
either parts of ourselves that we are. I mean, one of the early names for Fairyland or a variation of Fairyland was Cocaine. Uh, which is a land of eternal, I think all the houses are made of food. Uh, it's a land of eternal indulgence. So an excluded part of us and all of the other things, our behaviour um, or any excluded group, uh, we can, they're a bit, they're a bit fey. They're a bit otherworldly. Mm. It's, it's the other. Yeah, uh, it's the young, young shadow really, isn't it? Yes, yes yeah. it is. Oh. Oh, well, I'm glad I asked that question. Brilliant question and brilliant answers. But I'm afraid we've come to the end of our time. That is an hour and 15 minutes. It's gone past so fast. I've got a million more questions I could ask. But um, thank you all so much for listening. And thank you especially to Alan and Susanna for the most fantastic way to spend a Thursday evening. Oh, Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.